Professor Levin Smith the role of summer rules in the discovery of the standard model. Okay, so uvažanje tovarishi. The last time I gave a talk at Lebedev about theoretical particle physics was 41 years ago. Then that was the correct way to begin the seminar. <laughs> I don't know today. Uh, that uh, talk, my talk today is historical. And I want to begin by saying something about the talk I gave 41 years ago and what was going on at that time in particle physics in the world. So my talk 41 years ago was about the a relativistic formulation of the clock model for mesons. And it was rather badly received, not just here but everywhere in the world. <laughs> and we forget that the clock model was deeply unfashionable. It was regarded as not simply naive, but ridiculous. Um, and not only were quarks regarded as ridiculous, but in fact at that time, let's see, uh, how do I get uh, this one? Yeah, uh, even field theory, people said field theory can't be right. Everything must be ace matrix theory, everything is made with some bootstrap. And one of the leading of this idea was Jeffrey Chu, and here is a statement. I believe the conventional association of fields with strongly interacting particles to be empty. I do not have firm conventions about leptons or photons. Field theory is destined not to die, but to fade away. And this is what most people believed at that time. So one person who did not believe that was Dick Dulles, who was working with spectroscopy in the quark model. But nobody liked that. In the 1966, World Conference, the Rochester Conference in Berkeley, Dalitz was the rapporteur on Hadron spectroscopy. And in his talk, he based everything on the quark model. And in the middle of his talk, Galman, who was sitting in the front, stood up, very obviously, walked out of the room. So people really didn't like this. I was a student of Dalitz, but that is not why I was working on the quark model. I also thought, it's ridiculous, how can strongly interacting particles be behaving like three quarks? And I discovered in the literature a paradox found by Van Royen and Weisskopf, which seemed to suggest the quark model was inconsistent. So one day I said to Dulles, who had been working on different problems, uh, why don't you give up? This paradox shows this doesn't work. And he said to me, if I could see a relativistic derivation of this paradox, maybe I would give up. But I've not seen it, so I started to work on that. Eventually I found a way around the paradox. But one day in 66, I guess, I said to a colleague, this quark model is stupid, but it's a very good way of remembering all the data. And it suddenly said to me, in that case it's a good model. What is a good model? It's a way of thinking of the data. So in a sense I was rather lucky. Uh, I was working on quark model very, very early. But uh, as well as the way to quarks was the spectroscopy route of Dalits, but another way was through deep and elastic scattering. But we have to remember that until 68 there was no data. And in fact, most people thought it was a waste of time. Uh, there was a big division in the world. Most people thought proton accelerators were the way. Um, I looked at the statistics, the first conferences I ever went to in 69. This was only a European conference, but it was all on data from CERN and so on. It was 610 people. The electron-photon conference was a world conference, only 240. And most people thought photo production, why bother? All you learn is the same as with hadrons, but with a lower cross-section. Maybe that's true. But electron production, everything will vanish at high Q squared because of the form factors. So this was the situation when my story begins. So my story begins in 1965 with the other summer. So this summer is actually true of all Q squared, and this is in modern notation. In fact, if you take the limit Q squared goes to zero, then using various tricks, this is reduces to something called the adler weisberger relation, a relation between GA, the axial uh, decay constant, and pi on cross sections. This was discovered in 64 and was known to be more or less correct. And this really started the whole business about current algebra. But that was a, a Q squared equals zero. This was the first Q squared not equal to zero sum of, which I think nobody paid any attention to this. I had not heard of it until several years later. I mean, in fact, when you look at it, 
it really suggests to you that the limit of q squared goes to infinity might exist, which most people thought was zero. And if you write it in this form, this is equivalent, it really suggests point-like behavior. But nobody saw that in 65. Bill Kane saw it in 67, and I'll show you what he said in 67, but nobody paid any attention. This has a simple part on interpretation in terms of the ISIS spin up minus ISIS spin down, but it's actually not a part on summary. This is true of all Q squared, uniquely of all summaries. At this time, there was no neutrino data. I don't think anybody thought this could ever be tested. But in fact, it was tested not so long later, and it works rather well. You don't get one, but within the errors, you get one here. Now, the, uh, that's how this is derived, by the way. I won't look at that. So the first summary that really suggested scaling to be okay was his own summary on the polarized uh, deep and elastic structure functions. Uh, I've added the QCD corrections. Of course, in 66, QCD is not known. That came later. Now, this summary was derived uh, with a rather complicated technique, which some of you are old enough to remember, of taking the limit of Q0 goes to I infinity in this expression, which I've written for spinless currents for simplicity. And if you do that, you get an infinite series of sum rules involving omega, which is the inverse of what we call X today, related to commutators of currents and their time derivatives. So the Bjorkian sum rule was for n equals zero, so it's just a current commutator. But the higher sum rules, to calculate the time derivative, you have to take the commutator of the current with the Hamiltonian. So those get interesting because they start to tell you something about dynamics. Now, if we go back, Bjorkian said, look, we don't even have unpolarized cross-sections, so this is worthless. We will never be able to test this sum rule. In fact, of course, it's now been tested, and it gives a value of GA over GV in rather good agreement with the particle data group taking all the corrections in here. But what Bjorkane noticed was that if this is for the asymmetry, the difference between parallel and anti-parallel cross-sections, the, the sum must be bigger than the difference. So he worked out an inequality, and this is the first time he said, that's really interesting. This means that inelastic scattering must be very large, and, in, uh, and this is electrons, the previous thing was neutrinos, in fact, comparable to scattering of point-like charges. That's the first mention in the literature. Maybe we could see something like point-like charges. In the same paper, Bjorkane says, maybe the E plus E minus cross-section goes like 1 on E squared. Most people at that time thought that you'd look at explicit channels, all would have form factors, maybe going like 1 on E to the sixth or something like that, and the cross-section would vanish very rapidly. And he also noticed that the neutrino cross-section should rise linearly. This was not noticed at the time. I remember at CERN in 68 when I went there, there was some evidence that neutrino cross-sections were rather big uh, compared to cross-sections going to constants, which people expected. But I, I don't remember anybody quoting this. So Bjorkane was a long way ahead of his time. In the next year, Bjorkane really realized that uh, the... Uh, Adler Summerall was really telling you something about incoherent scattering of point-like constituents. And in fact, Bjorkane had the Parton model uh, years, a couple of years before Feynman. So I put what he said here. This is from the proceedings. So this is on the Adler Summerall. This result would also be true were the nucleon a point-like object because the derivation is a general derivation. Therefore, the difference of these two cross-sections is a point-like cross-section. It is B. He goes on to say, we assume the nucleon is built of some kind of point-like constituents, which could be seen if you really looked at it instantaneously in time. If we go to very large energy in Q squared, we can expect the scattering will be incoherent from these point-like constituents. If they have isospin a half, the sum rule says is the number of isospin up minus down is one for any configuration of constituents. This gives a simple-minded picture, which may look better if we look at it at the center of mass of the lepton and the incoming photon. In this frame, the proton is contracted into a very thin pancake. The lepton scatters instantaneously in time in the high energy limit. Furthermore, the proper motion inside the hadron is slowed down. And uh, so it's not a bad picture. So this is the parton model. But it's before Feynman. Feynman, I think, in probably 68, was thinking about partons 
as a way to think about hadron cross sections. He had not thought about lepton cross sections. So really it should not be called the Feynman Parton model, it should be called the Bjorken Parton model. Also in that year, Gottfried had made a sum rule, which was uh, actually not necessarily at large Q squared, but Bjorken had interpreted that in his same talk at the Slack conference and in his lectures that summer in Verena, in terms, in modern terms, would say something like this integral is a third plus two thirds the number of uh, anti ups and anti downs. So, so these things were beginning to come out in 67. In 68, uh, Bjorken then published a derivation of scaling in a very complicated way with these infinite momentum limits, commutators of the Hamiltonian, all sorts of things. But the peculiar thing is at the end of his paper he says, that's interesting, in a formal way I've shown that we could expect some scaling. However, he says, we need a more physical interpretation of what's going on. Which is very odd because the year before he'd already given a physical interpretation. And I asked Bill Kane, how come you had partons without scaling and then you had scaling a year later without partons? And he said, well, you know, I knew they went together, but I was very uncertain. We had no data, so I didn't have real confidence in these things. In this same year, the first data came from Slack, and it was presented at the Vienna conference by Panofsky, the director. Here are some of the data. This is the structure function as a function of 1 over 2x, so name and mega. And you see for different q-squared going from, uh, that's 1.2 to 2.9, that's a limit <laughs> factor of 3, but seemed to lie more or less on a universal curve, and it was not dropping off of q-squared. So this was a big surprise, and suddenly people started paying attention to what Bjorken and others have been saying. This is Panofsky's talk at Vienna. The cross-sections are very large and decrease much more slowly than momentum transfer than the elastic scattering cross-sections. Therefore, theoretical speculations have focused on the possibility these data might be evidence of the behavior of point-like charged structures. The apparent success of the parameterization of the cross-sections in terms of nu over q squared, in addition to the large cross-section itself, is at least indicative that point-like interactions are becoming involved. So this is the moment where people really said, hey, Maybe there is something in these uh, electro, uh, inelastic scattering experiments. Maybe we can learn something. If we go to 69, uh, Feynman went up to Stanford to give a talk about his ideas about proton collisions. And Bjorken said to him, hey, but this also works with lepton collisions. And somehow the name, Feynman's name was published, basically because Bjorken is a very modest guy, to the Parton model. Bjorken and Pascos published an explicit model. And also quite important in that year, Drone Levy and Yan, using the wrong fields of course, made some sort of part of model with an infinite momentum cutoff to give super renormalizability. But this was quite important because it was a laboratory to work out other processes to which this picture could be used as well as deep and elastic scattering. And the first one was the Drone Yan process of muon production, of course. In that same year, uh, the first sum rule which involved the time derivative of the current was worked out by Cullen and Gross. And that's very important because it gives you information about the Hamiltonian. And they looked at two different models. A quark model with some sort of interaction between the quarks, pre-QCD. I think they took an abelian gauge theory or a, maybe a scalar exchange. And they looked at something called the algebra of fields. Sorry, that's spelled wrong. Long forgotten. And they found the big difference. This was zero in the quark model and infinite in the algebra field. So this was quite exciting. It said there is some way with these data we can find out what are the spin of the things that we're scattering on. But at that point there was no data. Uh, just after this paper was uh, written, David Gross came to CERN. And at that time I was working with John Bell on neutrino interactions. And I heard David give a talk about the parton model. And I thought, let me see if I understand these ideas. I'll see if, what they would say about neutrinos. So I worked out what the parton model would say to neutrinos. And I went to see David. And I said, look, uh, did I get it right? And he said, hey, it never occurred to me to apply this model to neutrinos. Nobody had applied it to neutrinos. That's a good idea. Uh, I don't know if it's right. It's not been done. So then I told him there's an additional structure function, which he didn't know from the parity violation. And uh, we got very excited, thinking maybe there's a new sum rule, not just a part model sum rule, a sum rule. 
So in a very complicated way, we're going to the infinite momentum, taking q0 to i infinity, uh, we worked out this sum. Of course, we didn't know the alpha s over pi. At that time, we had the 2 over here, so this, uh, this integral was 6. And I remember David saying to me, we must have made an arithmetical mistake. No sum rule has 6. Sum rules have 1. Sum rules have 2. They never have 6. So that night at home, uh, I was trying to check, did we make a mistake? And it occurred to me, if this, is, this must be true in any part of model, if it's true from all the algebra of commutators. And I realized this is measuring the baryon number of the constituents. And then we wrote a paper on this. Shortly before that, various people had realized that the idea of scaling was wrong in field theory. There are logarithms. It's OK, up, but there are logarithms. But we just ignored that. Our paper says there's no reason to believe field theory is relevant. So this data from Stanford, although it went from q squared equals 1 to 3, we were very arrogantly said that tells us there are no logarithms. Uh, now, of course, in this summer, we know the corrections to alpha cube. There's been a lot of work on the higher twist corrections. And it's used to measure alpha s. And it gives quite a good value, in, which is agreement with the overall value for alpha s from the particle data group. This is extrapolated up to the z mass. In September of that year, the first data on sigma l over sigma t came out, and we were asking, is it going to be infinite for the algebra of fields, or zero? And it looks as if it was going to be very small. So this was quite exciting for the people, those of us working in this field. If we, oh, that's a test of the sum rule, and that's the first data on sigma l over t. In the 1970s, still things were quite confused. There were many ideas on the market. Part of the model was just one, not the one taken most seriously. Diffractive models, the Harari model, generalized vector meson dominance, Feliciano models, etc., etc., etc. In that year, I had the idea of uh, basically what I'd done with the uh, summer, writing down an absolutely general part of the model and saying, what can I derive independent of any assumptions about what the actual part on distributions are? or how many anti-quarks, or whatever. And I found two results. There was this one, which I worked out with moments for all possible moments. So then it has to be true by an inverse moment transform, and this has horrible singularities. And I also worked out this inequality, that the EP uh, plus EN has to be bigger than 5 18ths of new P plus new N. It's an inequality we didn't know about charm, then, if there are no strange quarks. So this seemed to be quite interesting because it's telling you something about the charges of the quarks. But the reaction that people gave was, hey, but that's actually you can derive from vector dominance if you say the photon always goes through rho and the phi, which was believed at that time. Then you would get one ninth. Uh, if this is one ninth, it gives you five eighteenths. So this is nothing to do with quarks. Of course, we should have thought the other way around. The fact that the rho omega phi couplings gave you this result was telling you something about quarks. But that's not the way that people thought because they didn't like quarks. Uh, at that time, it was a bit of a problem because uh, this seemed a very small, well, in some sense, many people thought all these things would be zero. But if they were going to scale, they expected a bigger number, not non integral charge. But the data were even smaller. And the, but at this time, uh, the quark model, especially Gell-Mann, was saying we should take a model with just quarks. We should find the algebra, and then we should throw away the model. And nobody was thinking about anything but quarks. And I think this paper is the first one that says we could get this number down from the number we got in the quark model to the data by adding a background of neutral constituents, which could be responsible for binding. So that's the first probably reference to gluons in this context. In fact, well, here is some test of the quark charges, assuming no strange charm and quark. And of course, this is for the 518s taken out, so it should be 1. So it's really telling you there are rather few strange charm uh, quarks, but it also telling you about the quark charges. In the next year, actually, I worked out a sum rule uh, by working out that this integral was uh, the quark piece of the energy momentum tensor. So it was 1 minus the gluon piece of the energy momentum tensor. Again, worked out in a very formal way with commutators, the infinite momentum frame, God knows what. And already then, the data was saying, well, it was a big error, but it looked as if a lot of the momentum was in something other than quarks. So I think this is the first um, direct evidence uh, with even a number in it with a big error 
from Bronx, uh, long before the three jet events and so on. 72, Grima from the part of summed up the leading logs, a, a very important paper. And the same thing has worked out using the operator product expansion. These people have really not got enough credit because they developed the operator product techniques, which were later used for all the scaling violation calculations. And also at this time, there was the first data of the anti-neutrino of a neutrino cross-section being around the third, which is very indicative of quarks, of course. By 73, a lot of the focus in that year was on neutral currents. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, yes, in this year, gauge theories were shown to be renormalizable. So this was really raising the interest in gauge theories, but we didn't have QCD. This year was the year of neutral currents, also asymptotic freedom and QCD. So this looks a little bit like the end of the story, but it isn't quite, as you'll see. In the same day, year from the neutrino experiment at CERN, the Y distribution, which was just quarks and no anti-quarks, should be 1 minus Y squared, was measured to be something like 1 minus Y squared, which is, uh, for the anti-neutrinos, sorry, flat for neutrinos. So this was very encouraging. On the other hand, there was an experiment at uh, the Harvard Penn Wisconsin Fermilab experiment was showing some big anomaly. The data were wrong, in fact. But at that time, we didn't know that, and it was suggesting uh, there is something deeply wrong with these ideas. 74, there was also confusion. The first calculation of scaling violations, corrections to the sum rules, theoretically, we were moving ahead. But in the same year, the first data from SLAC were published on the E plus E minus annihilation cross section, which everybody expected would fall like 1 over E squared. But the data seemed to say something else. And there was also still the high Y anomaly and other things. So let me show you the data. These, this is the ratio of the E plus E minus cross section of slack divided by the uh, point light cross section for muons. So the, from scaling, you expected a constant, but it seemed to be rising linearly. And here is Richter. The data in 1974, well, there were 61 theoretical contributions to the conference explaining these data. I think probably at least 60, probably 61 were wrong probably 10 by John Ellis. Um, so what Richter said is, the data contradict the simple model and be okay with scaling. His own favorite model, he said, this is very like hydronic interactions. And probably we're seeing some no photon annihilation. Now what was actually happening was a mixture of things. Around here, they were drifting in and out of the shape side. So that from one run to the next, the data was very inconsistent. And they, they never occurred to them they were moving in and out of a resonance, so they put big um, bins on the Q squared in order to smooth out this effect. And then here is the beginning of the charm threshold. But I think people didn't realize that. But in November of that year, the JPSI was discovered, and eventually all this became clear. So we're almost at the end of the story. In 75, there was the first evidence for scaling violations. So these are data of either the rapporteur at the conference uh, showing at uh, small x, large omega, the structure function going up with q squared. These are going beyond slack. These are Fermi lab data. And at large x going down. So this was the first indication that up to then people have experimentally thought scaling was exact. It wasn't exact, but the tendency was the tendency expected uh, in the Parton model, or in QCD. 76 charm, 77 QCD. So, I know I've only got two minutes. The next 30 years, overwhelming evidence for QCD, now mainly of interest as background rather than signal. A lot of work on higher order corrections to sum rules, higher twists, relations between coefficients in different cases. We're going to have talks later this morning. A lot of work by Kataev and others, and particularly on the Kruger relation, very interesting. And sum rules are now used as constraints on part on distributions or ways to measure alpha s. <laughs> So, uh, if we go, yeah, this way. Here's the data today going up to Q squared of <coughs> 2 times 10 to the 4th. And all this was guessed from these data right just in this upper Q squared of 3 at the beginning. And you see fantastically accurate data showing the correct trend and rising at low x, falling at a large x. Here's the data on 1f2 plot today. Here are the parton distributions. They have errors, but remember, this is time at 10 to the minus 3 or 4. In those days, we were only interested in this tiny bit between about 
point one and one at the bottom here. So to conclude, uh, some rules are now used as constraints on particle distributions or ways to measure alpha s. But historically, they provided the first suggestion of point-like behavior before the data, the first direct evidence for quarks, their spin, their charges, the baryon number, and the first evidence for gluons. So they really had a fantastically important effect historically. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. Now, there are some people old enough to remember these times. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned this uh, work by uh, Chris Mueller uh, and Hans Yeah. So, uh, sort of an interesting counterpoint connecting two of your points. I asked uh, Al Mueller why he hadn't come up with these ideas you know, at some point, because if you look at the gross wheelchair papers, it's sort of amusing all of these. And he said at that point, he was thinking about E plus E minus. And there it seemed like you had strong interactions, so he didn't consider using an asymptotic AP model. And he was at uh, Slack summer school with David Gross, and he mentioned this point that you're seeing strong interactions in E plus E minus. And apparently, Gross was totally uninterested in the data and said, No, this is why I asked about it. Really. So, yeah. so that was a uh, story from that perspective. Well, of course, without asymptotic freedom, we didn't know really what we were doing, and that was a big surprise because people have published, Tony Z published a paper saying, I've looked at all possible theories, and none of them are asymptotically free, mm -hmm. but he had not looked at gauge theories. Actually, at Hoft was the first person to calculate negative beta function, and Coleman said to uh, Wilczek, why don't you look at gauge theories? So really, Coleman is the person who identified, I think, slightly before Gross and Wilczek, probably the right calculator. I mean, just last statement is not actually correct. Bob <laughs> wasn't the first guy to calculate ah. negative sign. Just, no. just, you know that elephants originated in Russia. So just, uh, okay, so the, first, the, the first calculation was made by uh, Terentiev and Banyashin. Oh, okay. They calculated something like uh, getting the failure of uh, 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 Lagrangian, Lagrangian for. Okay. Uh, Gauge field for non ambiguous gauge field, and they found correct, exactly correct, the better functions. And, That's very and interesting. it was 65 or 4. I don't really? yeah. But how did they calculate? Because we didn't know how to regulate gauge fields. I, 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 I will explain this. And just two years later, Yuri Kripolovich from Novosibirsk calculated just also green functions in, in Coulomb gauge, and he used not uh, he used green uh, <coughs> procedures to quantize, you know, how to quantize you, uh, when just, uh, you solve uh, constraints order by order. So just his calculation was perfectly correct. And these guys, the first guys, they used this uh, unitary game. Okay. So they had problem with calculations uh, with dependence on the other. That they was, it, it was not actually correct. But coefficient in front of okay. infrared coefficient well, logarithm that depends on logarithm arch of magnetic field. That's right. Right. It's just coefficient of the Okay, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. But but of course, if they knew it and Hoft knew this, but Hoft did not appreciate what this was saying about scaling. It was the lack of a connection. Because obviously, Rose and Wojciech realized we can do something with this. And they immediately started calculating all the moments. So, is there no any questions? So let's thank our speaker. Our next speaker is Alec Tirai.